We have made a good deal here, one time or another, about the importance of checking back to ideas that have been held at other periods in our culture and have gradually lost popularity. One of the reasons why we feel that reviewing of this kind is substantially good is because today especially many of our convictions are not the direct result of the exhaustion of older concepts, but have arisen from the arbitrary dismissal of them. As this dismissal has been largely the result of what we call the scientific attitude, which is rather critical and skeptical of any possible superphysical or metaphysical type of phenomena, we feel that some of the modern conclusions may be arbitrary, based upon prejudice or disbelief, rather than upon sound investigation. We are perfectly justified in rejecting that which is disproven. But we are not really fully justified in total rejection in areas where our own knowledge is extremely limited. Until we have grown wiser than we are, may pay, therefore, to see what other people have known and what they have thought on subjects of concern to us. We have already mentioned that in the ancient world, dreams were regarded as a legitimate uh, phase of man's life. It was simply assumed that the dream world was real, that the individual going to sleep passed into another dimension of existence and that in this dimension of existence he had certain distinct experiences. And these experiences, when brought through in a confused or imperfect manner back into waking consciousness, might be fragmentary, even inconsistent, and still have a meaning that is essentially true or essentially valid. Now, we are not inclined to think today of the dreamer's world as anything more than perhaps an area of psychological function in which the individual releases through the relaxation of his objective faculties his own interior subconscious content. This does, however, point out two possibilities. The first, that there may be some validity somewhere in the belief that man's sleeping changes world. And there may also be a valid concept underlying the idea that if sleep represents a gradual retiring into the subjectivity of our own inner life, that there may be more in this inner life than psychology as yet has been willing to admit. Let us think through for a moment the Chinese and Greek and even the old Egyptian belief that in sleep the soul of man passes into the after-death state. That sleeping is in reality a time of focusing of man's consciousness on another level or plane of function. That therefore, that the sleep world is a kind of place or condition to which individuals temporarily pass. During this sleep experience, they have certain temporary experiences which parallel the after-death state. The Egyptians, who were very thoughtful about this, 
have given us quite an exhaustive concept of the afterlife. They have implied, for example, that in the afterlife the individual is punished or rewarded according to certain merits or demerits. Punishment consists of a process of cleansing, similar to the concept of the Christian purgatory, which merely means really a place of cleansing or of the purging of the life of, of its uh, various negative attributes. In the underworld of the Egyptians, the soul is therefore constantly being tried or tested in the great court of the gods, the principal episode being the psychostasia or the weighing of the soul. The Egyptians tell us this, therefore, that death is a process by which consciousness is brought into the presence of punishment and reward. To a smaller degree, then, may not the sleep phenomena carry somewhat of this burden. Psychologists tell us that during sleep the individual certainly comes face to face in dreams with phases or aspects of his own submerged personality. And the psychological dream is usually one of a basically corrective nature. It is a punishment experience. It is an experience in which the individual faces some phase of himself which he rejects during his daily conscious life. Also in dream, that which is submerged or hidden from his awareness escapes from its place of hiding and comes again to confront him. Most psychological dreams tell us that there is something wrong with the person. This thing that is wrong may not be criminal or evil in that sense at all, but it is something which is not right which is not normal, healthy, natural, and proper. And as we know that the average person does not live an entirely proper life, that he is not always right, and that his conduct is not always above reproach, even his own reproach, we can quite readily understand uh, that the mistakes that he makes, the false beliefs that he holds, uh, the unreasonable or unwise opinions which influence his conduct, that these could produce and usually do produce a psychological backlog that becomes locked in him and which is available to him most directly either in sleep or in what is called reverie, a process resembling sleep in which the individual becomes relaxed or receptive to the impressions of his own psychic life. The Egyptians holding their position then might not be so different in their essential concept from many of the opinions that we hold today, but because they put their thoughts into a highly theological language we are inclined to regard their feelings as merely a survival of primitive religious doctrine. Actually, the fundamental point involved is that sleep and death being aspects of one general condition, that they are phases of human existence in which punishment and reward play a distinct part. Now in punishment, as far as the person is concerned, we know that anyone, and nearly everyone, can be punished by his own memory. But the things that we have done are never totally forgotten. And that the mistakes that we make, injuries that we cause, unhappiness due to us, 
All of these leave markings in our remembrance. And these markings, in turn, may arise or be reactivated uh, to give us pangs of conscience or to give us guilt mechanisms of one kind or another. If we block the memory of man, a large part of psychotherapy would be useless and unnecessary. It is memory that actually undoes it, forcing us to face the previous conduct of ourselves and to compare this conduct with its own consequences and the misfortunes which have ensued. Thus, uh, the idea that the sleep life is a place of purging has some very definite validity. We know that dreaming existed long before men had any conscious knowledge of psychotherapy, that the dream preceded any formularized concept by, we, by means of which it could have been influenced into existence. The individual was not originally taught that his dreaming was important. He had the dreams and he felt their importance. And gradually from this feeling, he has developed his reaction to sleep phenomena in general. Presuming for a moment that it is possible that sleep is therefore a way of bringing the individual into more immediate realization of his own character. Perhaps in sleep the individual must come nearer to living with himself than at any other time. Also he comes in contact with a kind of self which he otherwise might never know to exist. In our daily objective lives we are living largely by patterns, by pressures, and we are conscious because of a continual excitation of the central nervous system. If, therefore, we live forever objectively in a waking state, it is quite probable that many of our faults would never be corrected. That in some mysterious way, the sleep problem is not only important to us as a physical means of relaxation, but as a moral means of continuing the processes of adjustment by means of which our characters are brought into harmony with our ethical convictions. All of this is of comparatively slight meaning to most people today, but I think psychological procedures are indicating that it is essentially true that uh, for one reason or another, the psychologist has hit upon the dream as one of his most valuable instruments, and he frequently follows procedures which are inclined to cause the patient to have significant dreams, or to stimulate the dream processes. And under analysis, many people, most people, dream more frequently and more intensely than in the normal processes of living. Thus analysis bringing with it a measure of thoughtfulness about self and its conduct. This type of thoughtfulness seems to increase the tendency for the patient to have more frequent and more meaningful dream experiences. We also think of the dream experience as one means of exhausting certain types of pressures. This might be quite valid in itself. It is one way in which the Hercules ego can cleanse the fables as one of his twelve labors. Uh, this process of cleaning out the subconscious by bringing into objectivity all of its content is to a measure a way of attaining virtue. It is a process of gradually solving the inconsistencies of the inner experience. Outwardly, we are not necessarily logical or consistent in action, nor are we sufficiently observant to consciously record the various happenings 
that mark the day. In sleep, however, it is as though a judge sat upon a bench, weighing and estimating almost all of the processes by which our mental and emotional actions have been stimulated. Our motives are more carefully analyzed. Uh, the various secret desires or feelings that we have carefully hidden from other people are suddenly exposed to us. All things being equal, therefore, dreaming appears to arise especially in connection with a certain neurotic type of attitude. The individual who senses guilt, the individual who blames himself, or feels that some mysterious force operating through his own personality is injuring him. This kind of person most frequently dreams. Also, this person finds dreams more important to him. Many individuals down through history and in our time do dream and pay no more attention to the dream than into any other uh, vision or mystery which comes to them. They assume that an occasional dream is natural, therefore they think very little about it. If, however, the person is introverted or inhibited, the very processes which make him think too much about himself also cause him to think too much about his dream. Thus the dream becomes increasingly important as he tries to understand it. And he nearly always tries to understand it in a negative way, as though it implied guilt of some kind, or testified to some false attitude or uh, error of conduct on his own part. Thus, as the Egyptians believed <coughs> that there was a judge ruling over the dead, so there seems to be a judgment in dreams. The individual is placed under a condition in which he must listen to the verdict of a judge or jury. He is in a kind of court where he is being tried and where his various mistakes cause penalties or result in the imposing of appropriate penalties. So that the person is penalized in his sleep for the things that he does while he is awake. This would all fit into the general philosophic concept of the ancients on this matter. The Greeks had a somewhat different belief. In many instances, they associated the dream with the initiatory rites. This means that they in large agree with the Egyptian. For the Egyptian regarded the after-death experience as a form of initiation into the mysteries of the blessed God. The Greeks, rather more directly, more naturally, and somewhat less theologically, because of their very type of mind, assumed that the dream represented a highly, uh, shall we say, intensified a way of passing through experiences. The dream gave the individual a greater sense of the meaningfulness of life. It helped him to experience life as initiation into the great mysteries of deity. In the dream state, therefore, the individual followed a ritual hardly less fantastic than that of the Eleusinian or Sabazian rites. He proceeded to travel into the underworld. He went into the abode of Dis or Hades, God of the dead. Here he beheld the ghosts of others performing incredible and mysterious tasks. And the ghost world described by Homer and by other Greek poets, Hesiod, and in the plays of Sophocles and people of this kind, this ghost world is very close to the idea of a dream world, for it is inhabited by persons under some kind of compulsion. And these souls under compulsion perform all the fantastic duties or uh, absurd actions which we find represented by Dante in his Inferno. Thus to the Greeks, the dream experience 
was a key to the waking experience. It revealed in a mysterious way the secret of our daily life. Therefore, man, by his sleep, solved the mystery of his waking hours and discovered the primary importance of events that might otherwise pass unnoticed. The gods of Greece were said to give their revelations in symbols. And nearly always the dream symbolism has paralleled very closely the religious symbolism of ancient institutions. The Eleusinia and all the other rites taught by means of symbols. The uh, disciple or the initiate passing through the ritual was expected uh, to study these symbols. Uh, to become inwardly aware of their meaning and to discover under the veiled truth uh, the great mysteries which were concealed in allegory and legend and lore and rite and ceremony. Thus to the Greeks, a sleep was part of an acceptance into the temple or sanctuary of reality. To them, and to many others, in fact, sleep phenomena has been regarded as, as more valid than waking phenomena. Now, of course, our modern friends would probably consider that to be a uh, little better than an absurdity. But is it absurd? Does the psychologist, when he explores dream symbolism of a patient, discover in this dream experience that the patient possessed the knowledge greater than that which the patient consciously knows that he possesses. Is the dream more honest than our daily conduct? Does it reveal truth of which we are not consciously aware? If such is the case, then the dream is instructive. The dream does represent a valid source of knowledge. It represents a means of discovering value which might otherwise never be possible to us because in the complexity of a waking consciousness, our sense of value is frequently distorted or in one way or another confused. So perhaps the Greek has a point, namely that the dream is a valid source of knowledge. Also, experience has taught men from the very beginning that certain kinds of dreams were dreams of communication, and many of the world's choicest secrets have been discovered as the results of dreams. Some of the world's greatest disasters have been averted by dreams. A vast amount of knowledge that we now consciously hold came to us first as the result of sleep phenomena. I think if we remove from the history of knowledge all forms of scientific, philosophic, religious, cultural, artistic, or aesthetic, or even trade skills that had first been re revealed by dreams, that we would be still in a rather uh, primitive condition. Actually, most knowledge the ancients held came from the gods. But man was, in, was first in, instructed by divine beings. And this is little more than saying that this knowledge came to man not merely from his own experience, but by revelation. The dream is therefore a valid form of revelation and has always been so regarded. It has been present as a, an instrument of direct divine knowing among most ancient peoples. Even today, among primitive groups, the final emergencies of life are met by the dream. When the individual is unable to secure any practical insight from ordinary means, he goes into meditation or prayer which departs from the world or seeks the assistance of some mystic and there in the mystical trances and dreams and visions he finds 
in concrete answers to problems which he cannot otherwise solve. Knowledge has come to man through the dream vision experience since the very beginning of his existence. The psychologist may agree that this is evidentially true, but he may hold the position that this is possible because the subconscious part of man is essentially wiser than the conscious. But this subconscious part has a skill that the conscious nature does not possess. Why might this be true? One answer could be very obvious. Most of the things that we do in life, we do to advance or for the advantage of our temporal objective state. The individual is selfish, unkind, cruel, gossipy, worrisome, angry, because these conditions are part of his objective, waking way of life. They seem to be justified by the things that happen to him. They seem to be made necessary by the kind of world that he lives in. The question then arises, does this inner part, the subconscious part of man, this subjective self, does it have the same appetite? Does it have the same requirements, the same attitudes, and the same convictions? For instance, can the subjective part of man be bound to a creed, even though his conscious mind may be so bound? Will the objective part of man be able to free itself from the dogmatism of opinion as easily as this unconscious internal part? The answer to this appears to be that while the objective man is a conformist, the psychic being within us remains forever seriously individualistic. This psychic part of nature, of man's nature, does not become as conditioned by external as does the objective consciousness of man. This may be due to a different distribution of sensory perception. For it is true that man's eyes because of the peculiar relationship which they occupy to phenomena, has given, have given man a great sense of material realities. Whereas the psychic life, ob observing things not by the eye, but by some intuitive or internal measure of knowing, may not be so easily over-influenced, confused, or distorted in its judgment. Unless there was some part in man better than the parts we generally know, there could be no reason or excuse for true conscience. If the individual did not have a conflict arising between the compromises of his action and the principles which he inwardly holds to be true, he would probably have very few psychic disturbances. It is because somewhere in him there is a better self that he can come in conflict with this better self and therefore also derive from it the impetus to self-improvement. There has to be something that is stronger than what we are or we would remain what we are. There has to be some factor in our life that is dissatisfied with our present conduct, or we will never improve. That which is dissatisfied with what we are seemingly always impels us to be better. Therefore, within this dissatisfied inner something, there must be a vision of betterness, a sense of betterness, even a knowing of betterness superior to that with which, with which we face daily life. The ancients, perhaps from this circumstance alone, contemplated the superiority of the soul over the body, and they further divided the soul itself into a higher or lower organ, declaring that the higher organ of the soul was by nature essentially more virtuous, more splendid, uh, more contemplatively wise, 
more aware of reality uh, than that part of the soul which being immersed in matter becomes the animator of the body. Consequently, we can see why the Hindus, the Greeks, the Egyptians, Persians, and most other people have sensed that the journey of man inward to communion with his own soul was essentially a journey in the direction of betterment, of improvement, of something nobler, that the soul of man within man was nearer to the divine than the objective faculty. Perhaps by being nearer to the divine, the Greeks would have told us that what is really meant is that this soul was closer to the understanding of the law governing matter and mind and substance and essence uh, than the objective faculty. But the soul had a superior power to cognize value. And that because of this, the soul is the better part of man. And that this better part is the natural shepherd or leader of the rest. That the soul is therefore the priest over the body. That the soul is a spiritualized being in comparison to the body, which seems to be a materialized aspect of the soul. If all these speculations are old, they are also surprisingly new because of this point that we have attempted to make, namely that almost all psychotherapy takes for granted that the disturbance to man's outer nature arises from the disturbance in his psychic life, and this disturbance in its disturbance is conflict. If the psychic life was identical with the objective life, there would be no reason for this conflict. If it knew no more than the objective faculty, there would be no reason for conflict. But if, as in the case of a family, a parent having a greater wisdom, beholds in a child an action contrary to its good, it becomes the duty of this parent to in some way instruct or correct that child. It appears, therefore, that it is forever the duty of the psychic self uh, to instruct or correct the body, the personality, and the objective mind. And where the body or the mind depart from ways of righteousness, the soul communicates its displeasure by a series of intensive symbolic experiences. Thus, uh, perhaps the modern and the old meet. We are dealing with different words, but with essentially the same ideas. We have already analyzed or discussed at some length the reasons why the psychic life apparently is better able to reach man during sleep than at any other time. Because during this period, the objective dissenter is temporarily suspended. The, uh, as Buddha points out, the machinery of the sensory perception, having ceased, man is relieved of the pressure of the appearances of things, and is therefore relieved of this thing, this feeling that most people have. What I see is true. If you can't fool me, I saw it with my own eyes. And the individual who says, these things I have seen, these things I have experienced on my own skin, these things which I do not like or which may not be happy are nevertheless true because I have recorded them. And I have recorded them exactly and precisely with the assistance of the sensory perception. The person saying this is in a highly defensive position. He is in a position in which he finds it necessary to live in conformity with these testimonies of things seen and heard and known through immediate contact. Yet these things in themselves are highly relative. Even one uh, very careful thought about the world we live in 
will reveal to us that the conduct of the creatures of our own kind making up this world, this conduct is more unreasonable, more inconsistent, and more fantastic than a nightmare. Actually, the things that we uh, accept and see and regard as realities because they are occurring in our physical uh, experience, these things are many of them completely unreasonable, and as far as validity is concerned, they are not by any means actually true. Yet we have a kind of truth based upon external material experience. This kind of truth can be important, but only if we light it from within ourselves. On the other hand, we are not all consciously able to light it. We are not consciously able to take the things that happen to us and cause them to be the immediate conscious cause of growth. Nature is concerned with the advancement of lives, the advancement of the consciousness of being. Man himself lives for many years, sometimes an entire lifetime, without ever having truly accepted the challenge of the experiences which have occurred to him. He has passed through these things, he either has enjoyed them, or he has suffered because of them, and he goes no further in his estimation. He is definitely opposed to that which hurts him. He is definitely uh, desirous of uh, tolerating that which pleases him. And beyond these attitudes, there is very little logic. Actually, therefore, man's hope of gaining the necessary experience from action is that this experience be justly measured, weighed, and estimated by some faculty in man. Plato regards this faculty as the soul. That the soul, therefore, is the initiator. The soul is the power by means of which meaning, essential meaning, is contributed to experience. Now, well, essential meaning is very different from apparent meaning. For well, we can create and have created two kinds of code. One is the code of man, and the other is the code of God or nature. One may be regarded as the code of sacred things, and the other of profane things. To the, uh, for the most part, man has not built his material way of life upon a divine code. He has built it very largely upon a pattern of compromises down through time. These compromises are never entirely satisfactory and are frequently the cause of his troubles. Yet there may be another code known to himself, whether he realizes that he knows it or not. And this is the code of inevitables as they exist in the larger pattern of life. There is a pattern of law that must be fulfilled. We may break all kinds of man-made rules, and survive. But if we break this rule that is not made by man, but has an eternity in existence itself, if we violate that rule, then we come under serious difficulty. And nature will never rest until we have remedied this break and returned to a proper harmonic relationship with the essential pattern of life itself. The dream phenomenon seems to have a bearing on this. It seems to be a way of bringing man back again to the responsibilities of his life, where the conflict between the inner psychic nature and the outer conduct of man becomes too great. We may have definite indications uh, of mental disease. Uh, this type of situation nearly always arises from some violent disturbance which has disrupted the natural order of life and has caused the individual to become too deeply involved in a pattern which is not essentially right. This pattern continues to hurt him and come in conflict with a pattern within himself which is essentially right. Thus there is a world pattern which we are all trying to live by and an archetypal pattern which we must all live by if we intend to survive. These patterns are not identical, and the conflict between them represents the source of psychic stress. 
We know also that other things being equal, the fleet process is accompanied by a diminution of the entire uh, excitation processes of the brain and central nervous system. Under sleep phenomena, we react less violently to stimuli of all kinds. There is a noticeable tendency for the heart to beat less rapidly. There is a very uh, definite shift in the processes of metabolism. The metabolic processes slow down distinctly. We also recognize that there is a gradual separation uh, of energy from the motor system with the tendency of the body to become inert. We most of all notice, however, that this process gradually ends in the suspension of our objective mental functions. The study of sleep in animals and lower creatures uh, brings some interesting information for our attention. Uh, sleep as we know it, the kind of sleep that we have, seemingly is peculiar to higher forms of animal life. It is true that probably all creatures rest in some way. But as we go down the, la the ladder of living creatures, we find more of rest and less of sleep. We find that the sleep process is not accompanied by the total extinction uh, of consciousness that we find in man and the higher mammals. Thus we observe, for example, that in the human body, in rest, metabolism also uh, slows down, but not to the same degree that it does in sleep. Thus it might conceivably be that lower forms of life might not require sleep, and that sleep as we know it is in some way a psychic necessity. That sleep, therefore, in the way that we experience sleep, is only possible to creatures only necessary to creatures, in whose lives or in whose experience there is a conflict between their way and the universal way. Animals and the lower kingdoms of nature particularly live in such a consistent adjustment with instinct that it is very rare indeed for them to violate it. Man is continually violated it or has so reconditioned instinct that he cannot depend upon it. Thus, where instinct guides, where the creature does not come into any ordinary conflict with nature, apparently there is far less stress, far less wear and tear in the nervous system, and therefore far less need for sleep as we know it. Animals rest a great deal, but they have the wonderful habit of resting with one eye open. A cat will be very quiet, and you will think that it has been asleep for hours, but if there is the slightest indication of the unusual, a cat's eye slowly opens. Uh, it doesn't shake itself and wake up, it just simply has been kind of dozing. It has, however, never lost consciousness of its environment. The same is true of many other animals. Some animals sleep standing up, indicating that they do not need the total relaxation of the motor system that we have. An animal will stand with its foot in one position for hours. But at the slightest need, without any sense of awaking, the animal moves. It seems to be constantly aware of its own body and its ability to control its sensory function. It can rest, it appears to relax completely, but it does not pass into this peculiar coma-like state with which we associate human sleep. Some of the higher mammals do sleep, but they are also the ones that are now being noted to possess neurotic tendencies. 
and uh, as a result of association with man for some time, a number of animals have come, become violently ill. There is now evidence that we may need to finally develop animal psychology. Not because the animal is of its own nature psychotic, but because experiments have shown that if you subject a rat to incredible wear and tear in the form of confusion, the rat will become neurotic and will begin to show all kinds of symptoms by which it becomes more intimately associated with the human type. Uh, what causes rats to become neurotic? Well, one of the things that causes rats to become neurotic is noise. Continuous noise. Since the wear the poor little rodents completely out. Another thing that causes rats to be neurotic is the breaking of rhythms. If you place rats in a continually inconsistent situation, if you begin to feed them at strange and erratic times, if you, uh, for instance, make a little house for them in which you have a door in a certain place, and you teach them to come in and out of that door, and after they've done it for two or three days, you close the door up and put it on the other side of the house. They'll adjust, but do it four or five times into different parts of the little house without any reasonable explanation, and the rat will begin to become neurotic. In other words, the animal becomes neurotic when it is placed in an inconsistent situation and subjected to unusual tension. Well, I would say that this could apply to our way of life and might have some way of explaining why we become neurotic. The rat becomes neurotic when it is disoriented when it is no longer able to function according to its natural inclinations, or in which it develops various patterns and these are immediately violated. If there is a constant violation of law and order, the rat will become neurotic. And as it, be, as it becomes neurotic, it produces a whole series of interesting phenomena. One of the sure proofs of neurosis in rats is that they suddenly get very tired. Neurotic creatures get tired. They do not get physically tired in the ordinary sense of the word. They become nervously exhausted. Thus, a neurotic rat needs much more sleep than a normal one. Also, its appetite change. The neurotic rat eats more. It becomes more and more dependent upon various forms of stimulation in order to keep its organism functioning. Its sleep apparently becomes a method of nature compensating for tension. This may well explain then why the human being and other higher animals require sleep. This sleep is a method of compensating for inconsistent action or action which cannot be normally and properly planned for. It is a way of compensating for emergency, for stress, uh, for any form of unusual activity suddenly thrust upon an organism. If the organism is placed in a new environment, it will adjust. If this environment is changed, with reasonable regularity, it will continue to adjust. But if the changes are unreasonably rapid, the animal becomes neurotic. This may have something to do with our concept of progress, in which today values and securities are becoming uh, so difficult to estimate, and life is becoming so hazardous in terms of relaxation and security, uh, that the individual begins to follow the same neurotic tendencies as animals subjected to experimentation along these lines. Now when you get to the point then where your sleep process begins to take over uh, in a more or less consistent way as with us, it is natural that this sleep process should become increasingly necessary as certain types of stress become increasingly frequent or powerful. 
uh, sleeping and waking with man is obviously associated with the rhythm of the world around him. It has now been rather generally acknowledged that sleep phenomena is one of the legitimate links between man and universal phenomena. In other words, even the most skeptical thinker today is inclined to believe that uh, sleep and waking are tied closely to the light-darkness phenomena of the solar system. And that night uh, becomes a very important factor, not only because of darkness and of the limitations imposed upon the activities of ancient man, most of which, by the way, have now been neutralized, but night representing the loss of a kind of energy which is present during the daytime as one of the elements of sunlight. Therefore, the loss of sunlight becomes not only a symbol, but a factual loss in the vitality of the individual. That his vital elements, his vital resources, increase in daylight and decrease in darkness. But this is factual, because that light contains a stimulant or a stimulating factor. This stimulating factor, being removed by darkness, or being obscured by darkness, seems to mean a distinct change in the energy vibration to which the individual depends for his survival. Let us try to analyze that just a little more, because it probably has a great deal of meaning. And as time goes on, this meaning may be more evident to more people. If you take away the objective consciousness of man, you then reveal something in man that is otherwise concealed. It is concealed because the objective consciousness is so positive, so aggressive, and so active that we are not aware of the passive processes. They are continuing, but we do not know that they are. Take away light from an area of the earth in the process of day and night, and you remove what might be equivalent to the objective energy of man. The moment you do this, another kind of energy, which has always been present, but which has not been noticed, or realize because the solar energy is far more positive. This other kind of energy begins to take over. And in the absence of the solar energy, this other energy is more immediately noticeable and also is not counteracted or compensated for as it is in the daytime. In other words, the energy of darkness is not in a mysterious way overcome by the energy of light at night. Thus the sword of the sun ray no longer slays the dragon of darkness. And the struggle between light and darkness may be quite different from what we have mythologically considered it to be. Now if you take away the solar light, what other energy do you release? Of course, the most common thought would be lunar energy, because in much of the night, the moon may be active. We know that the lunar energy is real because it affects the tide. But we also know that the lunar energy is inconsistent because the moon passes through phases. We also know that these phases are also marked in the psychic life of man in the circulatory system and particularly in the uh, monthly cyclic periods of women. We know, therefore, that this lunar energy does have an effect. But this lunar energy, as we say, is also an inconsistent thing. So we may look for something even more basic. 
and we come to one almost certain and inevitable conclusion, namely that the earth itself has an energy that there is a kind of vitality that moves outward from the surface of the earth, that the earth is a mysterious electrochemical structure, and that the earth does emanate a kind of energy, that this energy emanated from the, emanating from the earth was known to antiquity, we are certain. And we are also known, uh, recorded, it is recorded for us, that this is a somatic energy, an energy which causes drowsiness, an energy which carries within it a very high psychic toxic content. That the earth energy, therefore, as it comes, is not uh, as constructive or vital or helpful and that this energy in particular has very little to contribute to the true psychic life of man, that the release of this energy may help to build up bodily structure is quite conceivable, even as it is almost certainly true, and experiments in connection with treating tuberculosis by sunlight uh, are a point in this. It is true that the solar energy is more stimulating, more irritating, and more involved in the, uh, the processes of the central nervous system. In other words, the solar energy is an activating energy. The lunar energy is a uh, periodic or cyclic energy, whereas the Earth's energy is one which is almost purely and completely physical and therefore has its direct effects upon the physical organism. It is therefore quite possible that during night, or during the sleep processes, part of the remedial agency accompanying rest is due to the fact that the Earth's energies, uh, liberated from the domination of the solar intensity, uh, this Earth energy does help to restore the material parts of the human constitution. Help the, this energy helps to nourish and feed those bodily factors and functions which are essential to survival. But this energy has very little part to play in the psychomental life of the human being. The energy of the earth, therefore, being uh, what we might almost term a kind of toxic energy, may, when the uh, solar energy is withdrawn, contribute toward the condition of exhaustion or the sense of physical weariness which associates itself with the processes of sleep. Sleep may then well be partly regulated by earth energy. Uh, during the daytime, activity being the victory of the solar energy over the Earth's energy. But the Earth's energy is related largely to growth, whereas the solar energy is uh, related largely to function. Thus, growth can imply or mean the restoration. Speaking, sleep has probably a number of factors involved in its causation. Now, sleep, as we have recognized it, has a number of different types and divisions within itself. We have always thought of the individual as being either awake or asleep. While this may be true, generally speaking, we are sometime going to discover that the term sleep covers a wide variety of different processes that there are levels and layers of sleep, that the house of sleep has many rooms, not merely this one departure from objectivity. In sleep, then, we notice a number of constitutional peculiarities, and the old stargazers came to some conclusions about these. We're not going to labor these conclusions, but they may be worth mentioning. 
namely that the sleep processes of individuals are influenced by the positions of planets in their nativities, and that persons with certain positions of planets have difficulty sleeping in various parts of the night, are more subject to being awakened, and have essentially different sleep rhythms. Now, for instance, we like to believe that everybody should have about eight hours, that they should go to bed around 10 o'clock, they should get up around uh, 7 or 6.30, and that this constitutes the good old-fashioned agricultural agrarian pattern based on the importance of milking the cow at the right time. Actually, these processes are among the imaginary rules which man has created. A number of persons, particularly of certain temperaments, find that eight hours of sleep will not suffice them. Others find that it is too much. The amount of sleep necessary is apparently regulated by a number of different faculties and circumstances and that one of the elements is the soundness or depth of this sleep. Some people sleep lightly, others heavily. Sleep may also vary from night to night in the life of a particular individual, affected by temperature, noise, climate, food, all these different factors. It is observable that the young generally require more sleep than those of older years, whereas the aged frequently flourish on comparatively little sleep, but may require more rest. Thus we find a clear division gradually arising between rest and sleep. Rest is very largely a process of reducing uh, the exhaustion of resources without necessarily sacrificing consciousness. Sleep represents a more or less complete exclusion of the consciousness factor. Some find sleep more easy in the early morning hours. Many artists and creative persons find that they do best work in the deep hours of the night. Many creative thinkers have been night workers and have found that the peculiar situation of night is especially suitable to them. Now, how can this be true if, for example, we know uh, that the, uh, the night energies have a tendency uh, to be numb or to lower the vibratory rate? I think the answer lies in this, that these creative geniuses have seldom been trapeze artists. What they have been, for the most part, is sedentary persons. They are persons who have done most of their creativity either in terms of mathematics, in literature, art, music, and creativity of thinking. And that they are therefore inclined uh, to achieve a kind of physical relaxation in which they rest the body but are able to maintain the stimulation of the mind. Also, as the person's internal life strengthens, he becomes less and less dependent upon the patterns of external living. The person, therefore, who psychologically is in constant or nearly constant communion with his inner life requires a different kind of rest and a different kind of energy from the person whose objectives are almost totally physical. Therefore, at night, the tendency of the world, of material things in that area, is to slow down. And in this slowing down of interruption, discord, and the pressure of excitement and excitation of nerve energy, the scholar, the thinker, the mystic, the artist, the poet, the musician, will find a quiet composure in which his own creativity is most likely to be available to him. In other words, he is by resting, achieving a kind of vision or a kind of sleep experience without actually being unconscious. He has made a more or less conscious bridge between himself 
as an objective person at his own subjective psychic resources. And in these resources are the areas of creativity which are therefore able to come through to him. If he was under tremendous nerve stress, fatigue would probably put him to sleep. But if he is relaxed under these pressures, he is therefore able to be receptive uh, to the psychic uh, pressures which most of us record only in dream phenomena. The next thing that we take on is this problem of the what I call the twilight hour. And this has more or less the uh, factor of tying all these ends together. Uh, to create uh, the major picture that we are trying uh, to bring to attention. Man, primarily, is a mental being. He is a physical being because he is in a physical body, and this body has certain needs which the individual must supply, and which he is adequately able to supply because he does possess a mental nature. And by this mental nature, he has the ingenuity and the creativity to meet the various needs of the body. Consciously, however, the average human being does not accept this point of view. He accepts the point of view that his reality is physical, not mental. That the mind, therefore, exists primarily to support the body. Whereas, more correctly, the body is merely a supporting instrument by means of which certain abilities are conferred upon the mind. Thus man, by wrongly focusing his energy or his point of awareness, has mistakenly assumed that his physical nature is himself. And under this false assumption, he has bound his mental equipment not to providing the necessities of his physical existence in the term of the simple needs, by means of which the rest of his energies might be available for other purposes, but he has cast all of his energies into this physical problem, and therefore as little if any opportunity or energy for the advancement of his own true estate which is that of a thinking creature. Thinking is largely defensive or evasive at the moment. It is merely the individual thinking himself in and out of difficulty. This is not the purpose of the mind. The purpose of the mind is to have a positive existence of its own. In the peculiarly small hours between uh, darkness and daylight. We have this period of twilight. This period of twilight corresponds also with a kind of equilibrium between earth and solar energy. The first ray, so to say, of the solar life is returning. It exists as an auroral glow. It is reflected in the sky from some other a part of the heaven where day already has arrived. It is, however, merely a glow of anticipatory light. And in the process of the mingling of this first feebleness of the solar energy with the subtle energies of the earth, there comes a period or a brief time when these two energies are brought into equilibrium before one conquers the other. As night falls, the earth conquers the solar energy. As dawn comes, the solar energy conquers the earth. The sun god Horus slays the uh, python, the god of night. But there is this period in which there is almost a complete equilibrium. In this complete equilibrium, we have a mysterious foreshadowing or a mysterious symbolic statement of equilibrium in the psychic life of man. We have a point in which, for the moment, there is no conflict, where things 
are in some such complete balance that both of the areas of activity are in harmony, each with the other. In this peculiar suspension, man has the greatest availability of his total life. He has those moments which are the nearest to being the accurate moment, the moments in which neither his addiction to the external nor his submergence in the internal dominate, each has united with the other. The Egyptians symbolized the peculiar twilight, therefore, of the dawn as a door between the worlds as an entranceway or gate in which lives could move both ways. In these hours, according to the Hermetic doctrine, the doctrines, uh, Hermes Trismegistus, the psychopompus or herder of souls, herd souls back and forth between the worlds of the dead and the worlds of life, or between the worlds of sleeping and the worlds of waking. In these moments, Two conditions of energy come so closely together that they form a mysterious alchemical compound. Perhaps it is the ancient symbol of the marriage of the sun and moon, as the symbol of the marriage of ma ma spirit and matter. But here in this equilibrium, there is a moment of validity that never uh, occurs at any other part of the 24-hour day of the 24 hours of the day. The old peoples believed that this point of equilibrium lasted only for a few minutes. Some held that the complete equilibrium perhaps only about three minutes. Then one or the other gains its ascendancy. And in the dawn it is the sun that gains ascendancy. Why is this also not true in the more in the uh, in the evening hours. Why isn't this twilight between light and darkness equally important? The answer is that this, the, uh, the nerve stress of the day has pr to produce a psychic exhaustion. And in this psychic exhaustion, the equilibrium is not achieved. The equilibrium seems to be based partly upon the body having first attained rest. Consequently, it is in the morning hours and not in the evening hours that this peculiar transitional period exists. It is usually somewhere between 4 and 5 a.m., differing again with the seasons and the ancient system of planetary hours and being conditioned to some degree by the motions and positions of the heavens each day at that hour. But the ancients held the basic pattern to be valid. In this uh, peculiar suspension, then, it seems as though the entire person is open at one time. Now, actually, man does not have a conscious experience of this openness. He probably awakes in the morning refreshed if his uh, rest has been uh, reasonably good. He does awaken energized with more abundant self-control, with, with greater optimism for the day, with uh, stimulation to make plans come true. He arises, if he's in good health, with the proverbial bounce and proceeds immediately to waste half of it with his setting up exercises. By the time he gets through with those, he's ready to go back to bed again. But he feels good about it, and he is optimistic, and that is a very important factor. You will never find an animal do setting up exercises. You have to be a little stupid to do it, but a lot of people believe it helps. The belief will help them if the exercises do not. Actually, man's problem of exercise is not also at all well handled. Socrates pointed out once that exercise 
was meaningless unless the individual who was exercising was accomplishing something. Socrates absolutely refused to take a walk unless he was going somewhere. But he strongly recommended that everybody be going somewhere. But the exercise must be valid. It must not be for its own sake, or you will produce only an athlete with a profoundly low IQ. The uh, problem of the morning awaking following this uh, rest period also gives us some key to these twilight experiences in the morning hours. If it is true, and there seems much to sustain, that there is a peculiar uh, psychochemical balance and that two states of consciousness have the greatest possibility of mingling without conflict at that time, then it is obvious that the internal life of man is most available to him in these hours. Also that the external factors or faculties have the greatest receptivity to knowledge. Also in a sense, if man has any power, which will enable him to explore himself, he will have the greatest facility in doing this in these particular periods of time. Thus the, the, uh, the communion of kindred spirits is established as the uh, balance is reached. From this situation, several things may naturally uh, come into expression. Man having at that mo moment the greatest availability of his own totality is perhaps in those moments the wisest that he can be in this world. This means that if there be some particular reason for a peculiar attitude, he can hold it. The Egyptians also had the thought that it is not important whether man remembers these things or not that actually they occur, whether we know it or not. And that by this occurrence, a certain internal psychic balance is maintained. That every time we reach this mysterious twilight hour, we have this interchange, whether we know it or not. And that this interchange is very important in maintaining the psychic health of the person. And if he does not know anything about it, this is perfectly all right. But he does arise more clear-minded and with greater available intuitive power as a result of this experience. It follows, then, that if in these hours there is some peculiar need that has arisen, if in this particular time of the meeting of two natures, brought together in at least reasonable rapport, if there is some particular exchange of basic idea or energy necessary, then we are very likely to have the significant dream experience. This is the time in which the psychic nature can most directly communicate with the objective functions and faculties of the body and mind. It is at this time that the will of heaven can be most quickly known on earth. It is at this time that the person behind the body or in the body issues its daily regulatory recommendations to the body. It is at this moment that the divine establishes its relationship to the person every single 24-hour period. This situation uh, is with something perhaps that needs to be remembered, for it is a kind of daily psychic quickening, a process of reestablishing a covenant between the inner man and the outer personality. This covenant is necessary to life, and if a situation in the conduct of an individual or in his habits becomes so impossible, that this covenant cannot be established, then he is in trouble. 
So you may say, what of a person on a swing shift who never has these hours available to himself, who uh, is in some line of work in which he is dedicated to that delightful path known as the graveyard hours in which he has to be awake then. As the research into the problem seems to point out that under those conditions the exchange still takes place but it is less obvious to the person. And when we realize that the exchange is exceedingly rapid and that the person might very well not be consciously aware of very much of it, uh, the uh, condition can occur just as it has occurred in the case of persons who are known to have been able to sleep without any apparent interference with conscious procedure individual, I told you the story of the man who was shot in the brain during World War I, who did not sleep again for 18 years, worked three shifts a day, 24 hours a day, without being tired, and was never aware of sleeping. But actually, he was sleeping most of the time, but doing so in a series of very rapid sleep experiences lasting only fractions of a second. He was having constantly alternating consciousness and unconsciousness, but it was so rapid that he was not aware of it. So that nature takes care of these things unless we prevent her from doing so. But that this psychic exchange does normally take place, there is much to indicate, and that may or may not be always known to the person. But inside of man, this exchange is also vibratorily necessary to his survival. If he is then under pressure of some nature, the pressure of need, the pressure of urgency, it is most likely that in these hours, these pressures will exercise their maximum effect and the communication may be in the form of a solutional occurrence, a prophetic dream, a vision, or a trance-like incident in which the individual will receive some kind of a direct impartment of vitality or energy from his own causal nature. Let us assume for a moment that an individual is uh, living a rather badly integrated life that this bad integration is gradually destroying the physical relationship between this person's body and his psychonervous system. He is worrying too much. He is too frightened over some situation that has arisen. He has lacked courage. He is drifting. He is postponing necessary decisions. He is confused. He is gradually going down for the third time in a sea of his own troubles. This situation, going on and on and on over a period of time, will ultimately result in what might be termed psychic exhaustion. He will come in the end to what we know as a nervous breakdown. Or he will continue policies and practices until he destroys perhaps his business or his home, or his social standing. Inside of himself, his own psychic life tells him that something is wrong. He is not quite able to bring these patterns together. He still remains uh, without a sense of the answer that is necessary to meet this emergency. So finally, in the course of this process of gradual suicide which he has fallen into, he comes to one of these early morning hour periods in which his own psychic life that knows better, his own over-self, as Emerson may have called it, in whose broader explanation and interpretation of things rests the true fact which this man has been unable to rescue from the things that have happened to him. Actually, he has always been in, a, in possession of all that he needed to solve his problem, but he doesn't know it. 
He hasn't read the symptoms correctly. He hasn't, in, he hasn't sensed the right significance of the symbols of happenings that have occurred. He hasn't taken advantage of certain occurrences which would have shown him what he was doing and why it was wrong. He has become confused, he has lost orientation, and he simply cannot even judge the merits or demerits of his own ideas. About this time, one of these vision experiences or dream experiences may strike him. It may come in a warning. It may warn him in some way of the impending difficulty. It may be a diagnosis. It may take originally the form of simply revealing to him the direction of his own troubles. He may awaken with an allegorical concept rather strongly set in his mind. He's been a good church man down through the years. It may possibly be that in this experience he will find himself reminded of the two men, one who built his house on a rock and the other his house on sand. Perhaps he will find himself standing on sand, which gives a way underneath him. Or in the midst of some morass or swamp that threatens to swallow him up. Perhaps he will find himself lost in a jungle or forest or wilderness, surrounded by savage animals that threaten him. Any one of innumerable symbols may come through to him as a representation that he is heading into trouble that his own life is like this morass and that he's bogged down, or that he is a small child wandering around in a wilderness or a desert where he doesn't know where he's going, or that some strange and incredible disaster hangs over his head like the sword of Damocles. Many persons have actually dreamt of the sword of Damocles and have seen the sword hanging over their heads. This is due, of course, to the fact that we draw upon stories and legends that we know in the effort to clothe these basic impulses which are in themselves usually formless. In any event, these things together could constitute a warning. They may send this man in some direction for psychological help, especially if the dream is repeated. Or it may be that this dream is enough to awaken the dreamer cause him to realize that he is in trouble and perhaps try to help him to direct his courses more wisely. To another type of person, the dream impingement or the vision symbolism may come as a direct therapy in itself. It may come in the form of the psychic overself showing the person the parts of his own story which he has never seen correctly. He may find, therefore, truly an advising situation. It may be that for a long time his worries have been vested in a certain stock that he owns, or in a certain kind of investment for which he is not fitted. Or he may learn by subconscious knowledge that he is in a profession, art, or trade which is not proper for him. One of these dream experiences may blast into this, the inside balancing, equilibrating consciousness simply says to him in one way or another, usually symbolic, look, Joe, you have been a barber for 20 years, but you were never meant to be one. You're never going to be happy or healthy because this isn't the thing you want to do. What you have always really wanted to do was to be a carpenter. So now go out and be a carpenter if you want to get well. Now, the dream may not be quite that clear or quite that obvious, but it will present in symbolic form the direction which the person should tra go or should travel. It would remind him, perhaps, that he has been on the wrong road and may actually use the road as a symbol. There are cases where persons in the wrong occupation have actually had the dream that either they were on a wrong road or that they had come down a street on their way home and had gotten into the wrong house. Now, the wrong house, of course, is a very interesting symbol because it means largely a wrong way of life. It means a wrong habitation of character. One man had a dream 
that he went into a house which he thought was his own, and it proved to be somebody else's house, and when he got in there, he saw himself dead in the front room. Well, this is a cheerful little thought, but what does it mean? It merely tells this man that he is in the wrong house, and if he stays there, he's going to find himself dead there. He is going to crack up. Now, whether he is physically dead or whether it symbolizes the fact that as long as he is in this wrong house, he will be as dead, as though dead. Nothing will operate properly. Nothing will work well for him. His present situation is wrong. He's in the wrong house, and in that house, he can only be dead. Nothing will ever truly come to life. Perhaps this man then rushes out of the house in his dream experience and rushes down the street. And where does he go? Well, he is, he is terrified. He is half sick. He doesn't know what that is going to happen. And in this dream, he rushes down the street looking in various directions to find where he shall go. And he finally comes to a church. So he rushes into the church and falls down on his knees to pray. Now, this is also telling him something else. It isn't necessarily telling him to go to church. This is really too obvious for a psychic experience. They are not that literal. What it is telling him is that he needs consolation of understanding, of inner character, that he is deficient in faith, that in some mysterious way he has not sought inner guidance. And the church becomes to almost everyone a symbol of divine or inner guidance. And the recommendation is, of course, that he listens more to the inside and less to the outside. That he doesn't depend upon his own objective mind, but depends upon this intuitive power, which men have always symbolized as a divine principle in themselves. Now, another interesting thing happens in a great many of these kinds of experiences. There is a strategic and carefully calculated point at which the person awakens. The time of awakening in the dream is sometimes of the greatest significance, inasmuch as it generally tells one of two things. Waking either indicates acceptance, and the moment there is acceptance, there can no longer be any problem. The redu reduction of tension by acceptance brings the psychological intensity of the vision to its natural termination. Or else, there may be so much resistance to the truth on the part of the individual that at a certain point, he rejects the experience completely and escapes by waking up. There is therefore uh, always this problem to consider, that as the various phases of uh, analysis proceed, perhaps the same dream will recur, but the individual will awaken at a different part of the dream. This is an indication of certain acceptances or massive rejection on the part of the individual. This, of course, also points out something that we cannot really deny and have really no intentions of denying, and that is that these kind of visions seem to also, in many instances, imply the element of foreknowledge. General foreknowledge is not difficult. An individual can dream, for example, uh, that he falls from a cliff and breaks a leg. Now, he may be quite upset by this dream, and he may be very, very careful from that time to stay away from cliffs. He assumes that the dream is a literal thing, whereas more likely the dream represents a symbolic accident. In other words, if he continues in a certain course of procedure, something will happen. For instance, how did he happen to fall off the cliff? The dream may vary on this point. Perhaps he is pushed off. Perhaps he is running away from something and falls over the edge. Perhaps he is tired of life and decides to cast himself off of the cliff. And having cast himself off, suddenly wishes he hadn't halfway down. This type of dream, therefore, of the falling, 
or dropping from a cliff may have a number of interpretations, some of them more or less uh, prophetic. Perhaps the dream is telling the individual that he can no longer run away from the incident, that if he tries to escape again, he will have some form of an accident, uh, that he cannot escape, that his present effort to run away from himself or from other things can lead him only to falling off a cliff. If six months later this person has not paid any attention to the symbolism, has made no change in his way, then a policy which he is practicing and which is itself wrong may close in upon him. One man uh, dreamed that he was trying to run away uh, from a certain situation that seemed very difficult. <laughs> And as he ran, he ran out into a road and was struck by a car. He had the sense of being struck, but as is usual in dreams, he did not have the actual experience of dying. He woke up after he was struck. The shock, the psychic shock of the accident awakened him. Six months later, his home fell apart. And he found himself with a divorce case on his hands. He had been trying to run away from certain characteristics. In so doing, he had undermined the stability of his home. And finally, the breaking of the home was represented by the accident. He ran out in front of the car which struck him. In attempting to run away from the, in this case, his problem was evasion of maturity. The individual refused psychologically to accept the responsibility of being a husband and a parent. He was in a panic. The attempt to run away was indicated by it, and the running away ending in a worse accident was then later indicated as the breaking up of his home. He knew it was coming subconsciously. His own inner life knew that if he continued this procedure, it would end in the destruction of his home. Consciously, he would not acknowledge this. And when the thing finally happened and the home broke, he was completely astonished. But actually, his subconscious knew all the time that his way of procedure could produce no other consequence. Therefore, nature takes the very simple but prophetic position that a fault never corrected or a wrong pattern never mended is always going to end in the loss of something we want. It is always going to end in the loss of something that is meaningful to us. What we abuse, we lose. And the individual running away is, was, in this case, the attempt to evade responsibility. So these kinds of dreams can take generally prophetic form, because uh, as soon as the incident actually occurs, then we are able to say, well, this is obviously what the dream meant. But up to that time, we were rather careful for fear that it may be a literal accident that it implies. In some cases, a physical accident may be indicated, and it may actually occur. But in the majority of instances, it is a symbolic one. Now, where it is a complete accident, following the direct pattern of the vision, where something is pre-visioned, as in the case of a man who had a vision, a very definite one, that the train on which he rode to the city every day was going to be wrecked. He saw the incident clearly. He even visually, inwardly knew the day on which this wreck would occur. He actually saw himself, apparently, in this wreck. And the day came. He simply refused to get on the train. He warned all his friends that he could, but most of them paid no attention to it, thinking it was merely some kind of an hysteria. The train was wrecked, but he was not on it. He had had a clear insight or foresight into an actual occurrence that was to take place. Now, in the terms of a vision or a mystical experience of that kind, how are we going to explain this? The first thing we know is that the person consciously did not have this record. 
The train had made this run for probably 20 years without a previous accident. It was not something that would be normally likely to be in his subconscious. Actually, therefore, there is only one answer, namely that the subconscious or the superconscious or whatever lies behind the conscious has the power of a certain kind of foreknowledge. That this foreknowledge may be available to certain persons at certain times. Why it is not available to other persons is a question that perhaps goes back uh, to the Eastern ideas of karmic compensation. In any event, some persons apparently either have so altered their destinies by their own conduct that they are entitled to escape from these emergencies, or in some way or other they were not intended to be involved and had to be protected. There is a belief in the Orient, and perhaps this is as good an answer until we find a better one, and it's going to take quite a little finding before we find it, it is very definitely that the entity, there is a belief in the East, that the entity coming into birth comes in with a certain karmic debt. Now, the karmic responsibility of a person is usually very much larger than could possibly be compensated for in a single lifetime. Therefore, it's a certain period in the process of embodiment, the entity as a psychic being, more or less, is shown the record, shown the debt it has to pay and how that debt will be paid and the various circumstances leading up to it. So that as far as the psychic entity or the incarnating entity is concerned, there can never be an actual moment in which the psychic being does not understand what is happening to it. In other words, there can never be on the higher part of man's nature any doubt concerning the honesty of the situations in which he is involved. But the objective consciousness is not aware of this. Therefore, it is possible that the archetypal image of the total course of a life and the depths and lessons peculiar to that embodiment in the terms of its karma may be available to the psychic entity and that this availability becomes the basis of an immediate prophetic power. As this psychic entity prophetic power factor has to depend upon the moving of physical circumstances to meet the needs of the karmic pattern. There has to be an interrelationship between the need of the individual and the core knowledge of the social motion itself. In other words, there has to be an archetypal motion behind every event that occurs. Every event that we see has to be a seed breaking through ground into visibility. The invisible part of that event lying in its karmic relationship to life and in the causes which produce it. If there is a, an archetype or an archaic record, not only of things that have happened, but of the natural unfoldment of life collective according to its own destiny, then the relationship of man to the common destiny may be available to the consciousness of the individual. In any event, incidents of this kind have occurred. No simple explanation uh, that will be of immediate uh, acceptance by all scientific and otherwise, no such explanation is likely to be found. The only answer has to be that there are dimensions of uh, archetypal records in nature uh, that are beyond our estimation, and that on these archetypal records there is a certain aura or area in which the future is almost fatalistically conditioned by present circumstances or conditions, and that this relative future can be grasped or known psychically. Thus, the person's place in this relative future can be anticipated. Where the anticipation does not occur, 
where the individual goes quietly to his destiny without ever knowing that it is his destiny. Obviously, under those conditions, the pattern works in its complete operation. But supposing for a moment man being an individual has along the course of his lifetime made certain basic changes in his own temperament. These changes may alter or condition his destiny. For with man as a self-conscious being, <coughs> destiny cannot be fatalistic. Thus, if for some reason his own relationships to events change, then it's possible that the psychic life within him is given the problem or given the responsibility to adjust his relationship to events to meet the psychological changes in his own nature. Thus one may be warned and ten are not. Uh, ten persons may pass through the same experience and one survive. The same thought was, of course, largely used in the development of the story of the Bridge of San Luis Rey, in which persons of many types gathered on the bridge when it collapsed. Each one, however, who was there, though apparently in no way related to any common moment or common point, each was where he had to be in order that the various threads of life should all work out. I believe that the so-called vision which deals with events to come uh, it merely represents the fact that the psychic nature is aware of this and aware of what these events must be but that if this awareness was communicated generally to the objective life, the entire process of destiny would be frustrated. The individual, without merit or without reason, being in a position to foreknow his own destiny and avert it, uh, would no longer be operating with nature. Because the only way a person can justly avoid a destiny is to outgrow it. And if he doesn't outgrow it, then he has no right to change it. The psychic life in him, being primarily concerned with the good of the individual and his ultimate fulfillment of the laws of his own being, will not be nearly so concerned with accidents and, and incidents as the perfection of character, regardless of cost in terms of life and death as we know these terms. Thus, there are many situations that can be considered but apparently this peculiar timing of ours becomes associated with the most generally valid period by means of which this interchange of worlds takes place. And that therefore this becomes a peculiar period, the twilight dawn, which is the great period of the instruction of man. And whereas in the rest of the day, he is instructed by the world around him. In this period, he is peculiarly instructed by the world within him and behind him. <coughs> and as a result of this instruction, there is a constant flowing of intuitive truth into his consciousness. This intuitive truth being, of course, the basis of certain inspirational growth from within himself. <coughs> Realizing this, we recognize that perhaps the ancient was right when he declared that at this time the worlds came together that a door opened and mysteries came forth and man in turn approached the gate of mystery and by the common interchange of his internal and external parts gained a continual participation in that which he needed to know in order to continue for man must be moved not only by the circumstances around him, but by the light within him. And as the light within him has very little authority during his <coughs> waking hour, it is in this other period that this inner life has its moment of authority. And in this moment provides the tremendous energy release that protects the individual not only through the rest of the 24 hours, but perhaps for many days. This understanding of this peculiar psychological process may have in due time its place also in our researches along psychological lines.
Well, I think our time is pretty well up, so that's about all we can do with it now. Now, this will be the last of our Wednesday evening meetings until after the first of the year. After the first of the year, why, I shall have to go to San Antonio, Texas, uh, for a short series of lectures, and we will begin our activities here again about the middle of January. At that time, we will also have a new series of Wednesday evening meetings. And the first series will be devoted to a reconsideration of the subjects given on Sunday mornings, which will be our annual world predictions. That, there will be five in this series. The second series in the spring program will begin sometime probably around March and will be devoted to, our, to a study in five evenings of our book, Man, the Grand Symbol of the Mysteries, bringing to focus upon this new material that we have stored away concerning the mysteries of the human body and its functions and its relation to occult anatomy and physiology. Those will be the two uh, classes of the winter season. You will all receive your programs in due time. And I thank you very much for being with us this evening.